Very excited, Ibrahim, about having this conversation with you. Super excited. For those in the world that don't know you, I would like to first start by you telling us about your origin story. As a kid of, of always looking for economic opportunity, how do I, how do I make a dollar? How do I uh, better myself? What you see as a moment, uh, you've traveled a lot recently in the Middle East. What are you seeing as pockets of promise, points of interest? I'll be, I'll be curious to, to hear your thoughts. In sort of Cairo, the, I, I, I'm just passionate about how do we think about changing, changing the world. Just really incredibly impressed with and encouraged by is optimism of young people. In most of the markets where I've been so far, most of the countries, the entrepreneurs are, are, are sort of relatively young. And, and that's something that really excites me. This episode is supported by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. Bridget Todd, its host, invites you to a new season titled People Over Profits. If you are into artificial intelligence, AI, this is the show for you. Download Mozilla IRL wherever you get your podcasts. We at Silverbacks Valley are big fans. Hey, welcome to Silverbacks Valley. I'm your host today and my name is Ibrahim Sanya. Gentle reminder before we start, click that subscribe button and never miss stories of founders and funders changing sports, tech and entertainment from Africa to the rest of the world. Now enjoy the show. Hey Prof, so good to see you and see you live. Greetings from Cairo. Uh, where are you at the moment? I'm in uh, the western part of the state of Massachusetts here. Um, it's up in the mountains, it's sort of uh, beautiful and uh, uh, I'm very excited, Ibrahim, about, uh, about having this conversation with you. So, um, no, thank you for inviting me to, to, to speak. Super excited. No, I'm, I just can't wait for the world to, for those in the world that don't know you, which I think is still a small population, because uh, we will get uh, those that don't know more today. I would like to first start by you telling us about your origin stories. What took you to the world of uh, private investments, uh, both on the academic and then personal and professional side? Tell us a bit more about that. So I actually um, grew up in a sort of relatively um, modest or blue collar family in the middle of the country. Um, nobody in my nobody in my schools had ever gone to a, an Ivy League college. Um, uh, as a kid, I, I um, starting at age twelve actually uh, worked on farms, and I was always interested in in sort of both improving myself as well as looking for opportunity. And so uh, the, at one point got a paper route, started working jobs. And then um, when, I, when I got to college, actually um, decided to open up a grill, a small, a small restaurant. And so I, I've always had this sort of entrepreneurial bent to me and really sort of looking about sort of how do I, uh, how do I sort of create something that can, can generate value. On, on the other side, academically, I actually um, uh, was a bit of a science nerd. So uh, studied biochemistry as an undergraduate, went on to Oxford to start a, a DPhil in biochemistry. But then, um, then the sort of lab really wasn't something that, that sort of was sort of scratching my itch. It wasn't something that sort of was my passion. At the same time, though, I'd become very interested in how do you take that science and create something of, of value. I actually spent uh, one year between undergrad and, and, my, and starting that DPhil uh, working for <clears throat> a large pharmaceutical company on this research project that was joint with a small biotech. And really sort of though the confluence of those two things, the, the sort of experience as a, as a kid of, of always looking for economic opportunity, how do I, how do I make a dollar, how do I, uh, better myself sort of financially, as well as, um, as well as this sort of interest in science and how do you take science and create real products from it, those two things uh, came together. And when I, when I switched and started doing my, my PhD in, in business economics, it was just sort of natural at the time to, to start focusing on private investment. And in particular, at that time, uh, venture capital. And what was interesting is that the late 80s and early 90s was really the, the, the sort of birth of, of sort of venture capital in, in the United States. And, and at the time, there really was 
almost nothing written uh, academically about how venture capital works and and how they work with companies and and what they do to sort of create value. And so so literally the I think the the year I started my PhD, there was something like a uh, hundred million, one hundred and fifty million dollars of venture capital raised in its entirety in the in the United States. And so, um, so really, the, my career has been this sort of confluence of things, and 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 being at the right place in the right time is also sort of part of it. And so, it's been this fascinating journey over the last thirty years, really looking at how the industry has sort of matured, looking at how it works, and um, really having that opportunity to sort of be part of the sort of foundational research on 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 the industry well i think uh you being very humble many of us have got our training done over your book uh, the seminal book you wrote with your uh, friend and colleague josh Lerner. and uh, i'd be curious to hear from you how do you think uh, the world and the landscape of private equity and private investment in general did you envision it to to look like it is looking today, 30 years later, since uh, you started all of it. What do you think did materialize as expected and what completely surprised you? So um, the, 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 the first thing which I think I sort of um, really thought was um, going to happen was that, that, uh, that venture capital and private investment would become a cornerstone of of sort of the economy um, that if you look at what venture capitalists do to align incentives, if you look at what they do to help these companies grow, if you look at how productive they are in terms of innovation and bringing products to market, it was clear to me even back you know twenty you know twenty five or thirty years ago that that the, that that the, that this industry was going to become the source of innovation was going to be the the source of of new companies and new jobs. And, um, you know, again, we've seen, you know, we've seen some ups and downs, but generally speaking, um, I was quite optimistic that it would, that it would grow. And similarly on the, on the private equity side of things, um, uh, there was some work done by a colleague, Mike Jensen in the late eighties, where he argued that, um, being a public company with dispersed ownership has lots of problems and that private equity is a solution. And so, 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 Again, I, the, the, what we've seen in terms of where private equity has gone and how much it's grown over the last uh, 25 or 30 years, again, I think that that that, that was something that, that I clearly saw as likely to occur. And as we sit here today, my view is that is that that we're likely just to continue to see the growth of of the industry. The, the one thing that I think I didn't predict um, perfectly, but we see today, and it's what I'm really interested in. It's a whole part of my uh, my my current research agenda is sort of the globalization of private investments, how we've seen private equity grow globally, and and how we've also seen investments in startups and venture capital sort of grow globally. And um, over the last several years, I've uh, been be become increasingly interested in these new ecosystems uh, around the world and really trying to understand what it is that what it is that's driving this interest in startups driving this interest in in venture capital and uh ibrahim as you know this this past year i've been spending a ton of time traveling to these new 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 ecosystems and and it's really driven by this 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 firm belief that the way we raise entire countries, the way the way we, we we sort of generate economic well-being and growth, is to harness the power power of entrepreneurship, to how, uh, harness the power of private investment, and 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 again, to the extent that my research and my writing can play a small role in that, it's something that I feel really blessed to actually be able to do because I, I do think this is the way this is the way we move whole countries and whole continents forward. That's phenomenal, Prof. One thing that I always appreciate when I chat with you is the benefit of uh, the veracity of the data you come up with, because you're one of the few that uh, leaves uh, the hidden life of a superhero. You're a bit uh, of a Batman or Dwayne Wade, like uh, during the day you are the super professor with all the academic knowledge and history on the territory. But you also run a fund of fund, one of the most successful one in terms of performance. 
I don't know which one is your cape, but uh, it'd be good to understand between that, within that intersection of academic and pragmatic, what uh, would you s distill with us in terms of uh, biggest lesson learned in terms of uh, the performance or how the the difference between the PE asset class, the VC asset class, and the private debt asset class in good times and in bad times. Because obviously the cycle of boom and bust is going to continue. But what has been your observation, you know, using your, your two lives? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, it, it, it has been interesting. And the, and, and the two lives are very synergistic. And, and you know, to give a little context, um, uh, I'd been on the board in the in the in the late '90s, early 2000s. Was on the board of an investment management company that had um, some 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 significant internal disagreements. And um, in 2001, along with three of the four senior principals at that firm, we co-founded uh, uh, Spur Capital Partners, which is, as you said, it's a it's a uh, it's a venture capital fund of funds and. And what's really been interesting is is the synergy between the academic research and the investment uh, investment decision making, and to be able to to try to put that 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 data to to use. And and you're 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 very right that there are certain insights which draw distinctions between sort of you know uh, venture capital, private equity, and and sort of private debt over over time. And so both. One of the things I've seen on both the academic side and on the uh, investment side, and, and you know, by way of background, over the 22 years at um, uh, at Spur Capital Partner, we've made um, roughly roughly 160, 170 venture fund investments. We've done co investments, <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, we're, we're a relatively modest player. I think we have about a, 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 a billion eight under management, which is relatively small by, by global standards. But, but as you sort of mentioned, we, um, we, we, we really hit above our, uh, above our, um, uh, weight class because, uh, last year when Dow Jones HEC did a global, uh, evaluation of, uh, private equity fund of funds, Performance out of 200 fund of funds, we ranked third globally, and and I think that that the in, the insights from the insights from research really helped um, us in terms of the investment and, and vice versa. And so, let me get to your your question specifically. So, when I think about what I've learned about venture investing, first, um, venture venture capital returns are driven by having access to the best founding teams. Um, when you invest in a startup, um, you don't know in particular what uh, what that company might be in the future. And in fact, um, I've written a bunch of cases on companies that start in one area and then have to pivot because what their initial idea didn't work. And the the great founding teams are able to to iterate quickly, lean experimentation, and able to find uh, the the sort of product market fit in a way that ultimately increases the chance that they're successful. And so, you know, the, the most critical element and, and, and the best venture capitalists I know really think long and hard is how do you, how do you um, both find, have access to, and then convince great entrepreneurs to take your capital? Because that's the, that last point is the most critical one, which is in, in, in startups, you have to convince the founding team to take your capital. And so you really need to think about what's your edge. How do I, um, how, how do I um, can convince the entrepreneur that I can add value to them? How do I convince them that I'm able to, to, to do something for them that other, other venture funds can't? So, so that's one critical element, which is thinking about deal flow, uh, access to great entrepreneurial teams. And, and that's something that for every venture fund we invest in, we, we both do the quantitative assessment of past performance, but it's calling other venture funds. It's calling entrepreneurs to make sure that, that this is a firm in which the best want to work with. Now, when, when you go to sort of private equity, it's a little bit different. And, and the one thing that, that, that I think here, the, the, the data and the research really do show is, is it's, 
it's about the private equity firm having a strategy to do something very specific with the asset. Do what's their expertise? How do they 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 drive either operational improvement or um, uh, having access to bringing in sort of great senior leadership to the company? Because uh, in most private equity transactions, it's a it's a competitive process. And in order to generate great returns, you need to take the particular company, the particular asset, and be able to, to increase value. It's not about buying low and selling high. It's not about layering on a lot of debt. It's, it's literally about having a particular expertise that you can bring to bear on that. And, and, and we again, I've seen this time and time again, where the, the private equity firms, which forget that, ultimately stumble and have uh, and have some difficulty late, later on. And so so it's it's thinking about what's what's your core edge in terms of adding value to to companies in a particular sector or a particular size or or, or with particular resources, whether it's uh, business development, whether it's talent or, or or the like. And so that 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 private equity piece is is very different. And the way you think about it is very different than sort of venture. And then on the, the private debt side, I think it, it, it then goes more to sort of the financial engineering piece, really sort of understanding companies and markets and being able to evaluate risk. And it's a different skill set. And it's, you know, in, in, it's an inefficient market and being able to sort of identify which are the risks you want to take and how do you do it. So it's, 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 sort, of a, it's sort of a pricing game in an inefficient market. And so the skill set that you need in any one of these three asset classes are very, very different. And this is where, you know, when I when I talk to students or former students, I really sort of say, you know, you know, what do you think your edge is? What do you think you're really good at? And I think that helps them sort of articulate where in the private investment asset class it makes sense for them to to, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, hang their uh, hang their hat or, 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 or where, where they should should go. But but. But but this is again, and you know, this back to this point, which is like it's clear from the data that that in these particular asset classes, in private in, in private markets, there's an ability to generate substantial returns over and above the risk, and that's that's something that I think is just very clear from from all the research. Excellent, Prof. I'd like to double click on your venture capital on what you said. Obviously, uh, picking the the founders and their capacity to, you know perform in an athletic manner, whether they're doing company A or company B through the pivot is really the essential piece. Now, under that wide portfolio of VC, have you been able to detect some subsectors that tend to have defensiveness irrespective of the cycle? Because basically, what what we've observed is, I mean, in my 25 year career with a good half of that being PE, on the PE side, it was clear that financial service and telecom have been uh, typically stronger than uh, the other sectors in terms of yield and gain provision, irrespective of the performance outfit or the team. In the short cycle of less than 10 years in tech, what we can see in our portfolio, which is a mix of direct and indirect investment, under technology, we can detect that fintech has performed better than nine different subsectors. It's also commanding the largest allocation, but is significantly higher than the next best performing sector at the moment. If you took out the five year, we, we have a five year uh, performance deck we can look at. And you can see that the next best is e-commerce. And then you have media and logistic. That seems to be your media tech and logistic. And in media, we actually have a subsector, which is sports, which is new on the continent. So it's very difficult to look at that with a long window. But the data shows that if you take a five year and a 20 year, financial and telecom have been like the dominant high yielding sectors. 
have you been able to detect uh, such a, a one or two sectors that last decade, the decade before, irrespective, have seemed to dominate systematically in terms of performance? So that's a great, great question. And, 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 and I'll, and I'll uh, give you a practical anecdote. And I think the, from our experience, what the sectors which perform better are those that um, have them either A, the most um, immediate need, or B, are at the sort of inflection point in the innovation curve. And, um, you know, th there are some in which we've seen cycles. So, for example, um, healthcare, we've seen some cycles. But our view is that over the long run, there, 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 are, there, are, there, there are global opportunities in, in all of these particular sectors. And so, at, at least from our experience, which primarily has been mostly U.S. with some China, India, and Israel investments um, mixed in as well, that... Um, you know, in those in those economies, clearly, sort of, you know, we saw a wave in terms of sort of e-commerce and and Web 1.0 in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, we saw we saw sort of uh, sort of Web 2.0 and the and then the the then growth in sort of uh, the uh, the cloud and SaaS and sort of the the sort of uh, late 2000s, early 2010s, um, and then as you said, sort of fintech over the last sort of five to five to eight eight, eight years. Um, but, but at the same time, the, one of the things we've, we've seen is that, is that even though we see sort of, um, the percentage going into these different sectors going up and down over time, there's still opportunity for great returns, um, regardless of the cycle, regardless of the industry. And that really drove us, for example, to, to sort of maintain our allocation to life science. So in the early 2000s, a lot of investors in venture were getting out of life science because it had been a disappointing, you know, five or eight year period of time. But we certainly believed that 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 the fundamentals of innovation in life science were still there. And so we as as many, many investors got out of life science, we continued our allocation and and it ends up being sort of really true. And so what we find is that in certain periods of time, so in the uh, sort of in immediately after the financial crisis through the mid 2010s, life science was actually the best part of our portfolio in terms of performance. And so what I would sort of say is like to not, you know, we will certainly see these ebbs and flows of certain sectors doing better and worse. Uh, it's it's my view that 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 I'm not uh, I'm not going to be able to time those sectors and and what I want is I want great venture capitalists who are the ones who 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 will be able to sort of identify the great founding teams, and those great founding teams are going to have um, uh, an opportunity to generate great returns regardless. And and maybe I'll just give you one story which which sort of sort of relates to this. So um, we were the we were the first um, uh, we we were the first. Um, uh, institution to invest in the founders fund, uh, in the founders fund. So in founders fund two, we were in the first close. This is Peter Thiel's, uh, fund. And, and, um, you know, here it is. It's, 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 I think 2005 was when we committed to them and, and they had, they had done, you know, in, in the first fund was all their own money. They had done Facebook and they're doing all these sort of things. And we were thinking, ah, we're going to get all these internet and social media companies. So Ibrahim, the first investment they did in Founders Fund 2 was SpaceX. And it's like, we were like, you're investing in rockets? What, what? you know? And, and it's like, literally, I can, rem I can remember being on a call, um, uh, uh, being on the LP advisory, uh, advisory committee and saying, this is nuts. And, 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 and now... And now, eighteen years later, I think I think SpaceX, SpaceX currently has a valuation of one hundred and fifty billion, and and it's like that initial investment uh, returned the fund many times over. And so, 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 the, but the, what I would say is that it just illustrates that that sort of great founding teams will find um, will find great returns despite you know independent of the sector and and. Like I said, I, I could give you lots of examples. I think the Founders Fund has probably been the best at this. I mean, they, they, they'll invest in everything from, 
uh, human resources in the oil and gas industry at Rig Up to <clears throat> export import at um, Flexport to um, defense at Anderol to SpaceX. And so their philosophy, and I think I've adopted this as, as both an academic and as an investor, which is what you want is you want great founders who, who are looking to build something in a very large market. And, 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 and I think that, that, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out. And that's, that's certainly something that, that, that sort of resonates with me, um, uh, globally as well. Wow. No, that's, that's a very rich anecdote to substantiate your point on, uh, on the hunting for the sector, um, leave it to the, to the GP, find the timing, let, leave them to find the timing and the opportunity and uh, provide them with more capital. Now, a slight uh, side segment to that, with that philosophy, does that guide any of your direction in terms of active and passive? Because obviously you mostly a, a, a passive, but what triggers that, that decision for more co-investment? Because there has to be some 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 guidance that emanates from all that experience. Great question, and 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 you know, over time we've been doing more co-investing, and certainly interested in in that. And you're absolutely right; we're not on the board, we're not actively investing. But um, one of the one of the places where I do think um, we're able to differentiate ourselves from other uh, LP capital is is is, is my academic background, being able to do research. So I sit on a bunch of uh, LP advisory committees. I'm on the, and have been for 20 years on the COSLA Conflicts Committee. Um, I, I refer lots of um, uh, startups to, to different venture groups. So um, I'm on sabbatical this year, but last year, 12 of my, um, 12 of my students went on and raised um, seed financing during, uh, during the second year of their MBA. And and one of the things I often do is try to be a matchmaker to try and help um, those students who are starting companies or former students who have companies uh, to raise capital. And so I'm an, you know, I'm a, uh, a, a, a source of deals for, for many of our venture, uh, venture funds. And one of the things is, is um, we often uh, get access to um, rounds where they perhaps don't have a, um, sufficient capital. And, and so that's really what we look to are rounds where the venture fund doesn't <clears throat> have sufficient capital to keep their pro rata, um, where they're super, um, uh, they're super bullish on the company. And we typically try to come in in the Series C or Series D, where the holding period may be you know, two or three years instead of eight or nine years. And that's really been very incremental to, to our returns, but it's really relying on the relationships with our venture capitalists who, we, uh, who, who we've built these relationships over, over 20, uh, 20 plus years. And, and, and it's really worked well, but, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not for everyone. And, I, and by, by, way of sort of, by way of comparison, I know um, a number of years ago, uh, a colleague and I did some assessment of the co-investment performance of a uh, Harvard management company, which is invested in a huge portfolio of private equity and venture funds. And um, they really did poorly. I mean, in fact, the, the direct investments had a lower return than the fund investments, which had fees on them. And so that's sort of saying that there's some uh, adverse selection that's going on, that the deals that Harvard management company was getting shown we're not the best deals because if you're not an expert, you need to trust the managers to show you their good deals instead of showing the deals that that they're not excited about. And so this, you know, the co-investment really does revolve around a relationship where you feel um, you provide value to to the manager and the manager as such is going to make sure that they don't try to take advantage of you. Wow. Very wise words. No, it's, it's interesting that. Uh... You, you pointed out because one of the, the 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 big piece we we exploit the most on uh, co-investment is really that relationship with the few VCs we're backing, trying to take over or fill their pro rata 
requirements. But the other thing also we're finding as an opportunity is a lot of these funds go on to raise fund two, three, and sometimes are lacking uh, the liquidity to provide the GP capital. And that allows you to sit at uh, an earlier piece of, uh, of capital gain. No, it's really interesting to, to compare notes. Uh, the other, I wanted to pick your brain as to what uh, you see as a moment. Uh, you've traveled a lot recently in the Middle East and um, last time we connected was in Cairo. What are you seeing as uh, pockets of promise, uh, points of interest uh, from where you sit? I'll be, I'll be curious to, to hear your thoughts. So, yeah, as, as, as we discussed in, in sort of Cairo, the, uh, I, I, I'm just passionate about how do we think about changing, changing the world? How do we lift countries, lift economies, create opportunities? And, and so this year, as, as, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm taking these extended research trips to different ecosystems uh, around the world. And having done the first three and now uh, scheduling the, the, the next two, one of the things I'm just um, just really incredibly impressed with and encouraged by is the optimism of of young people, and you know that even in developed entrepreneurial ecosystems, the um, entrepreneurs generally tend to be young. Um, in the U.S., I think the average age is about 32 or 33. Um, in most of the in most of the markets where I've been so far, most of the countries, the entrepreneurs are are, are sort of relatively young, and and that's something that really excites me, which is the the fact that that young people have this vision of creating something, that there's this inspiration, that there are role models out there, and 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 you know we see you know we see different countries at at different points along the evolution of their entrepreneurial ecosystems. But I actually think that that this is this is like a, a global tsunami that 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 um, because of <clears throat> because of access to the Internet and 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 stories about about young people uh, going and creating these kinds of huge success stories because of efforts to sort of provide access to capital and to training and skills and like that, that that we're building this we're globally building this generation of young people who will who will lift their lift their countries by pursuing pursuing their own economic interests to create jobs to create opportunities and so so what, you know I, I didn't really necessarily think that I would come out of these these uh, trips and be as excited as I am for the future and that's that's really one of the things that 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 that, that I've already sort of really internalized which is that 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 this phenomenon is happening and it's happening faster in some places than others but i believe that 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 um that that we will see this um grow and flourish um you know across all the continents and and that you know we again we 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 see it we see it progressing in, in at different speeds but i'm i am highly optimistic about what we see this episode is supported by IRL an original podcast from Mozilla Richard Todd its host invites you to a new season titled People Over Profits. If you are into artificial intelligence, AI, this is the show for you. Download Mozilla IRL wherever you get your podcasts. We at Silverbacks Valley are big fans. And uh, any, any work you're doing in the continent right now that have uh, left you uh, uh, with a strong impression that uh, is is something you view you will spend more time doing yeah so i um yeah i'm i'm currently pursuing uh, a case on uh tony elamelu's foundation and what he's been doing now for the last um uh 8 or 10 years um again uh you know um uh, mr elamelu uh, committed 100 100 million dollars to promote um entrepreneurship across uh, the continent. He's got this amazing, amazing online training platform with mentors and the like. He he's uh, committed to fund a ten thousand uh, startups, ten thousand entrepreneurs. They're I believe roughly halfway to that number, and they're they're continuing the program. 
And, and um, TEF, the Tony Alamello Foundation, is just this amazing, amazing um, private, uh, private foundation which is which is is transforming so many countries across the the continent, and he, um, the foundation is working with uh, global global financial institutions, other foundations to bring in more capital, to bring in more resources, and um, as part of this um, uh, case study, we've had the opportunity to to interview roughly a a, a dozen. Uh, graduates of the program, and they just talk about how it's changed their life and changed their communities and changed their families. And, and, and it, it really is this, this sort of shining example, how one person with a vision for, uh, you know, sort of transforming not just a country, but a continent um, can, can really do that. And, and both through his own resources, but sort of globally, what he brings in is, is, is just, you know, again, I think it's one of the most inspirational um, uh, one, one of the most inspirational cases that I've actually been able to be involved in because, uh, because of what it's actually doing. And this has sort of led me, one of the things, um, as, as you know, from our conversations in Cairo, I'm starting, a, in addition to writing the book on entrepreneurship outside the Valley and these emerging ecosystems, I'm starting a course at HBS for, um, for the, by the same topic, writing lots of cases in these different emerging ecosystems and I've actually proposed to um, uh, Harvard Online uh, Education to to start a Harvard Business School course for uh, emerging emerging market uh, entrepreneurs. And um, Ibrahim, one of the things one of the things that you should know is that the the, the least expensive online Harvard Business School course is two thousand dollars. And I've proposed that yeah, so, so I've proposed that this course get offered for $50 that, 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 and, and so, yeah. And so, so, so again, my, my, I am, I'm really optimistic today about what, what we can accomplish. And if we can mobilize, you know, you know, if Tony Elamello can, can mobilize global financial institutions, if I can hopefully mobilize uh, sort of Harvard business school and what we're trying to do in terms of education to address this this huge opportunity. I, again, I, I I think that the future looks really great. No, no, uh, Prof. I'm happy you've uh, picked Tony. Tony has uh, definitely been a shining light of the continent. You know, it's definitely one of those rare cases where the man has uh, is committed to leaving a legacy, to not die as a sole fisherman and leave many fishermen's around so that that's really uh the magic of uh what he's been able to engineer you know a lot of uh the it's 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 a it's an, a model of altruism that will create a lot of utility function for the continent and obviously using the network he's amassed over the years has been a client of of uh, my my previous life, and uh, definitely uh, we can only uh, tip our hat to him, and then to you for actually uh, create some uh, timelessness to his story, and that uh, should inspire other people to do the same. Now, uh, before we separate, I would like to hit you with a few rapid fire questions, if you permit. <laughs> Go for it, Ibrahim. Go for it. All right. First one. What's your favorite podcast show? So I'm going to give you two. One of which is uh, the Economist podcast. I'm a. I, I just. I just see it as as being sort of less biased and less political than than some of the other ones that are sort of out there in terms of current events and the like. And they they go into much greater detail. Um, the second one, which is a little eclectic, is. Um, uh, um, I listened to this podcast called uh, Daf Yomi, which is uh, uh, the, the the Talmud is the book of Jewish law. And I've decided to try and learn the entire Talmud, which if you learn every day for seven and a half years, you do this. And so every day I listen to a podcast on sort of the current uh, the current uh, page of the of the Talmud that's being learned that day uh, around the world. So so. One one related to, one related to sort of what it is I do, and then the other one trying to sort of just uh, enlighten myself. 
Beautiful, beautiful. One for the mind, one for the heart. All contributed to the hands. <laughs> to better hands. <laughs> yeah. Now, your favorite nonfiction book. So, Ibrahim, as you know, and, and we, we both share a strong interest in sports, um, I actually uh, ran uh, professionally and represented, had the uh, privilege to represent the U.S. in international competition and was uh, the alternate on the 88 Olympic team in the, in the marathon. So sports is a huge part of my life. And so when I, when I read, I, I, I like to read books uh, about sports. And so... Um, a recent book that I read that that's just amazing is called Boys in the Boat. And it's a it's a book about the 1936 Summer Olympic U.S. crew team um, from the University of Washington. And and, you know, this is during the Depression and, and the main character uh, about about uh, coming from a relatively uh, less privileged family and how the, they ultimately triumphed in the 1936 Olympics and uh, in in uh, in Berlin. And so. It's it's just a great story about triumph and, and the role of sports and 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 just highly recommend it. Yeah, well, definitely do. I'll just uh, for the merit of the audience, I'll just say we both in sport. One is inside the arena, the other one is on the other side of the arena. Because <laughs> obviously the audience is not aware of all the medals you've won in your life, but I think once they do their Google research, they'll realize be like, wow, who's this guy? Where does he find time? <laughs> <laughs> What's your most impressive VC deal story that you've, you know, that comes to memory immediately? So, so yeah, we, 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 I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but, but it is certainly um, uh, the most memorable story and the one which literally has worked out just incredibly well is, is the SpaceX story. And, and, it, it comes back to like what's possible. Um, uh, I've had the uh, I ha I've had the whatever you whatever you think of 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 him. I, I I've actually met um, and had conversations with uh, Elon Musk, and 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 it just goes to show how how entrepreneurs can change the world. And 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 again, the, this this sort of private industry in space and what what SpaceX is doing. Um, both just from a technological perspective, but then also from this perspective of 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 just tremendous wealth cre cre uh, creation and returns and the like. And and like I said, the 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 having having literally been on an advisory board call when when like they sort of said, yeah, we're we're you know we're leading the round in this this like space exploration company, and it's like. 2005, you're thinking, okay, this is this is this is pretty 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 nuts. What did I get myself into? Um, uh, and so so yeah, they, I mentioned it earlier, but it really it, it really is this thing that that sort of is the um, the the sort of what's possible, and that's that that that's that's why it's for me. Uh, that's why for me it's such such an impactful example. There are lots of other great returns, but but this is just super interesting and and super super in, uh, inspiring. Super cool. Something you've uh, predicted wrong and something you've predicted right. So uh, they're both the same. For sure, SpaceX was one <laughs> that you didn't see coming. <laughs> so, so it, it, Ibrahim, they both actually have to, happen to, to, to deal with the same uh, industry. So um, the, 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 what I really got wrong was the rise in crypto. And, um, you know, when, when everybody was talking about sort of Bitcoin and all this other stuff, and, and I, I admit I'm, I'm sort of an, you know, a little bit of an old stodgy finance guy in that respect. And I sort of said, no, this, this will never work out. This will <laughs> and so the rise in crypto is something that, that I, um, I, cer I certainly admit that I got that I got wrong and didn't see the didn't see the vision for the folks who who saw what crypto was going to be. On on the other hand, I also uh, sort of predicted the excess. So once we got really sort of to the to, to the stratospheric heights of crypto, it was clear to me that the incentives to 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 do bad things were going to be there. And so so a number of years ago was predicting that we're going to see. Um, we're, we're going to see a lot of um, 
bad actors get involved in the industry, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see um, uh, we're gonna have to see governments and regulators and courts come in to solve some of those problems. So so I got half of it right, but half of it terribly wrong. <laughs> how about uh, how about uh, this, this notion that cash is always king? You think it's uh, it is a a philosophy that's even more true today? I, I think it's it's less true. I actually think, you know, one of the things that we saw over the last five or six years in, in the developed ecosystems around the world is um, way too much capital. And, you know, you can lose discipline. So I, I actually wrote uh, for my prior course uh, on financing uh, startups, I wrote a case on WeWork. And the whole point of the WeWork case was just how too much money can, can delude the entrepreneur to thinking that she or he is, is brilliant above the, above the, the laws of, of, of sort of uh, gravity and um, not focusing on unit economics. So, so I'm working on a Harvard Business Review article now that, that, that goes through and argues why downturns can be a great time. In fact, perhaps the best time to start a company. You know, you have access to talent. Um, it was so hard to get talent over the last five or six years. Um, you can, you have the time to focus on unit economics to get to product market fit, you know, um, to, to, to think about the business model and cash flow and stuff. And so, so, so if you look historically, great companies get founded in downturns. And so, yes, you need cash. You need cash to build a business. But, but too much cash is, I think, even worse because, because it, it's very hard to, to go from the excess to sort of focusing on, on sort of unit economics and, and positive cash flow. It's much easier to build the business focusing from day one on figuring out how do you make money with the product or service or whatever it is you're sort of trying to do. So, so you know, I would sort of say you need the cash, but cash can definitely be a curse. Cash can be a curse. You should be focusing then on cash flow. Don't go chasing it in the other people's pocket. Try to get it out of your business. That's what I get from what you're saying. All right, all right. If you were forced to pick one and only one publicly listed traded stock and hold it for five years, which stock would that be? You know, we'll keep this fully private, only all over the internet. <laughs> But you must pick so, one. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, thank you. So, so Ibrahim, full disclosure, um, in the public markets, unlike private markets, where I'm a very active investor, believe in active investing and, and that managers add value and the like, um, in, given, given sort of the academic research around the inability of public managers to have persistent performance and like, I'm a, I'm a 100% passive investor in public markets. So, so I, don't, I don't trade individual stocks. Um, uh, ETFs all the way, low cost, hold, you know, long term hold. Don't don't look at what the portfolio value is every day. Um, but so, so 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 this this is going counter to 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 sort of uh, everything, uh, everything that I actually do. So 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 um, so I'm only I'm, I'm only doing this because I'm back into the to to the belief about com companies that sort of change the world, still have an opportunity to grow. And, and, and so anyway, and I'm coming back to uh, my Elon Musk and, and it, would be, um, it, it would be Tesla. And I, I actually think that, that Tesla has some huge uh, first mover advantages. One of the things you, you know, recently uh, GM announced that all of their cars, uh, electric cars in the future are going to be using the, the Tesla uh, charging system. And, and, and um, you know, uh, I'm I'm a I'm a firm believer that that you know uh, EVs are 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 going to be um, the 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 future. I mean, we've seen the growth. We you know we see it in other places growing even faster. And and I just think that 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 um, what 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 Tesla has built is, is a sustainable advantage, and it's super highly valued now. And and this goes against sort of market timing and the like. But but I think there's. I think there's still tremendous growth at Tesla from a from a uh, revenue and cash flow perspective as they as they sort of continue to uh, continue expand models and their innovation. So um, 
I, I, I'd, I'd go with Tesla. Tesla, all right. That's well noted. Uh, I think that's a wise choice. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm long on, uh, on Apple. So I think I'll just uh, take your, your advice. I think that Apple is probably the most hidden fintech company we're looking at every day. So considering the amount of pivot they've done, my, my only wish is that they manage to play the, the fintech industry elegantly without getting uh, clipped on by the regulator. Now, one question about uh, diversity and inclusion. What do you think can be a, a path to fast tracking that in our, in our industry, whether it's private equity, VC, there's a lot of talk, uh, there's a bit of action, but what do you think would be a, a, an innovative path to fast track that issue? Yeah, so um, uh, we did have, we had an opportunity to talk about this. So, so over the last, you know, uh, 10 or 12 years have written extensively on this issue of, of, uh, diversity in the context of, of startups, venture capital, private equity. And um, one of the things we know is that we all have these biases um, that cause us to evaluate people who are like us more favorably. And so it's not surprising that when we look at the data, men invest in men, um, that, that their portfolios are highly skewed to men. And, and this is a huge problem because if you look, for example, at startups, Women start companies that are more likely to address women's need. Women scientists develop solutions for women's health and other issues. And so if women, if women start, women led startups aren't getting the same kinds of capital because, you know, even in the U.S., 90 percent of, of, of investors are men. And so a huge, huge gap in terms of providing an opportunity and funding in a place where there's tremendous um a, a, tr a tremendous opportunity to generate great returns and to solve problems and create great companies. So, so from my perspective, the, the absolute most important thing for us to think about is to hire more women in the investment uh, side of things, to have more women invest investors in venture capital, to have more women investors in private equity. Again, the data are clear that women investors are far more likely to invest in in a women uh, in a woman led company, um, and so you know, certainly there are those who um, uh, have a passion for this. I know Melinda Gates is doing a ton of stuff in terms of financing uh, women uh, women led venture capital funds. It's certainly when we invest, we always ask that question, which is you know you know what's the breakdown of investors? You know what's your policy on hiring? How do you think about the gender issues? And I think. I think it's incumbent upon um, all the investors in private, uh, private equity and venture capital to actually ask their, their managers those questions. What's your, you know, what's your, what's your hiring policy? You know, you know, what's the breakdown of investors? How are you thinking about this issue of gender equity? But I think that you know, if we think about this chicken and egg issue, the critical, uh, from my perspective, the thing which has to come first is that we need more women in investing roles. Perfect. And uh, in the terms of people of color, you would suggest some similar? A hundred percent. So so again, um, I've written extensively on this. Two of my former students, um, uh, Jared Tingle and uh, um, uh, Henri-Pierre Jacques, um, uh, started uh, right after HBS, the uh, the largest uh, uh, black owned, black founded um, venture capital fund, and that's absolutely correct. That that if you look at what they're doing in the underrepresented um, uh, community in the U.S. in terms of investing in startups led by black founders and and sort of Hispanic founders and women founders, they're, they're sort of leading the way in that. And so it's absolutely the case that that um, if you look in the venture industry in the U.S., I think it's something like less than one percent of venture investors are black. And absolutely, I think, I think we need, we need the, the investors to sort of represent the, 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 um, the, 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 the sort of whole uh, set of opportunities. And it just doesn't today. It really doesn't today. And so that's, again, it's incumbent upon 
LPs to make sure that that the venture funds they're investing in um, have a strategy and are doing more to to increase the diversity of their investment professionals. But that's you know Ibrahim, that's a hundred percent sort of critical, and it's something that we do every single time we invest. No. Prof, I have to applaud you again. It's always good to see where your heart is, your mind is, and your hands are. And I can see that uh, on these issues, not only talk about them, we discuss them, but you always have some palpable action that demonstrate the thought and the, the heart. Uh, my last question before we separate. We, there's a statement that goes as follows, that the musician has to make music, the painter has to paint and uh, the writer has to write. What is it that Paul has to do to be? So, um, so I'm really motivated by um, um, this, this, this quote from Proverbs. There's a quote in Proverbs which sort of said, it's better to have, uh, it's better to have a good name than all the gold and silver in the world. And when you read the commentary on that, that particular Proverbs, what it's saying is by a good name, meaning when, when you pass away, what is it that you did to, to, to change the world? What is it that you did to make the world a better place? And so, so what motivates me and, and, and what it is I'm trying to do is to be, to be a, a builder, a builder who um, for my students, for um, for entrepreneurs, um, and 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 this is globally. Um, how how do I create the tools and the knowledge and the insights that that allow uh, allow others to 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 build their dreams, to to build their uh, countries, and 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 that's really what 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 motivates me. That's what sort of gets me up every day to to to. to uh, to work on what I believe is is sort of the most important uh, set of research that I've ever done to 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 really to really think about um, how can I how can I make it such that um, when I'm gone people can honestly say that he made the world better and that's that that's what that's really what um, motivates me and 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 really um, gets me very excited. Well, wow. on those uh, super inspirational words, Prof. I'd like to thank you for the gift of your time, um, for sharing so much uh, knowledge and uh, honesty about uh, what you're doing and what you seek to see uh, on this earth. I think uh, our audience will be most grateful for for everything you share today. I can only just uh, thank you from the bottom of the heart and uh, pray that you keep on doing what you're doing for another five, and hundred decade as technology get better. From your mouth, from your mouth to God's ear, and um, and and um, thank you so much. And and I, I look forward to to our next meeting and and uh, and and going to a basketball game down in Cape Town. And uh, thank you, th- thank you again for your friendship and for um, for including me in what it is you're trying to do. Thank you very much, sir. Stay blessed, and we connect soon. Bye. Hey, if you liked today's story, press like, leave a comment, subscribe, come back for more stories from the founders and the funders changing sports, tech, and entertainment from Africa to the rest of the world. We look forward to seeing you again soon.